morning. I'm Pastor John, and it's so great to be with you guys this morning. We're going to be looking at a selection of various scriptures this morning, but I want to uh, read a section from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. I know you just sat down, but if you're able to stand for the reading of God's word, please do so. I'd like to read Exodus 20, 1 through 17. This is the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth, beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Well, we come to the final sermon in our series, the series God's Design for the Family. And we have studied the, the good and the grace of the family from Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we looked at Ephesians chapter 5 and we, see, we saw the function and the beauty of marriage. We saw from Ephesians chapter 6 and Deuteronomy 6 the responsibilities of parents as they raise their children in the home. And we looked a few weeks ago at 1 Corinthians 7, and we discovered the wonderful contribution to the family of God of those who are maximizing their opportunity of singleness. And last week, Pastor Jay explained the important relationship between the family and the church. Now, not to sound self-serving as I happen to be the one preaching today, I'll say last but not least. Uh, We come to today's subject. I say last but not least because we can often forget this important responsibility in the family, the responsibility of children and adult children giving honor to their parents. Usually, as we are thinking of building strong families in in the church, we, we rightly define what the family is, for there's much confusion in our society. And we talk about the various roles and how we are to function in those roles. And we see how that benefits the home and it benefits the church. And we emphasize that when a couple marry, that they, they leave their family, previous families and they cleave to one another as they establish their own home apart from their parents. But such does not mean that we no longer have relationship or responsibility to our parents in adulthood. Yes, our relationship to our parents has certainly changed, but what does it look like? What should it be? And it's summed up in this command to honor your father and your mother. The main idea of our message today is that we must honor our parents as we trust in our Savior Jesus, who also honored his parents. We've explained in our sermons to the children, uh, those in the home, that God has commanded us to honor our parents. And, And in order for them to honor their parents, primarily 
that is seen in obedience and that they obey their parents in all things. And I'm sure those of you who are parents of young children or teenagers in the home and Pastor Jay was preaching that, you were amening all throughout the time. And such application must be preached in the church. And we are to do that, and it's good. And while obedience of young children to their parents is certainly in view in the command to honor father and mother, it is not the entirety of all that's intended in that command. The fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments was given to Moses. It says in Exodus 31, 18, by the very finger of God out on Mount Sinai. This law was written by God on two stone tablets to be delivered to the 12 tribes of Israel. And the first four of those, of those uh, laws uh, give command, regulate how the people were to relate to God in love. And he says they're to have no other God, and two, they're to make no idols, and three, they're not to take God's name in vain, and four, they're to remember the Sabbath day. And then the other six of those ten regulate how these people relate to each other in love to the honor of God. And we see number five, honor father and mother. And six, do not murder. Seven, do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. And do not covet what your neighbor has. And we remember that Jesus summed up all of this. Love God and love your neighbor. The law was given to the nation Israel, which were all ages, but we see that there was adults standing around hearing every one of these commands. There's application to all generation and all ages and all types of people, but it would include children in the home, but it was certainly to the adults of the nation. So honor your father and mother is, is rightly preached to our children, but it's preached to me and it's preached to every one of you. And just in case you might be tempted to excuse yourself saying, you know, wasn't that just in the Old Testament? Wasn't that just to the Hebrews? Note that this command is repeated throughout the history of the Bible. In fact, this was given to, the, to that generation that walked across from Egypt, across the Red Sea on, on dry ground, and, and then they wandered around for 40 years. And the next generation, it was repeated. And by Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, he says again, Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. They were getting ready to walk into the land. And he says, you need to do this, that it may go well with you. You think like, okay, yeah, but that's still Old Testament. Well, in the Gospels, Jesus, to the Jews in the Gospels, he, he says, why do you, in, in Matthew 15, 3 and 4, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. That's from Jesus. They're like, okay, but he was talking to the Jews. What about us Gentiles? Well, we know in Ephesians chapter 6 is to the church of Ephesus, which was primarily a Gentile church, and he tells them there, and he, he repeats this command. And so this is for us. How do you suppose the command to honor your father and mother applies to you today? And maybe you're wondering, is it even possible for me to apply that today? Is it proper for me to apply that to my particular father or mother? What if they have been dishonorable in their actions? What if they have died? How do I apply this? What does it look like for you as an adult or a teenager or a child? Personally, I, I find myself looking at this command from a variety of perspectives. I have a minor child in the home that is to be taught to honor her parents. I have an adult child that's in our home part-time, but will apply the same commandment even slightly differently. I have adult married children that are raising my grandchildren, and this, this applies to all of that in some way. I also have living parents in whom I must honor if I'm to obey this command, I have deceased grandparents that we speak of. How am I to apply this in speaking of them? And I realize that there are other scenarios out there that 
you may have experienced that I have not yet or maybe never even will, how does this apply to each of us today? Now, I recognize that the application to this command will look different at times. And in some cases, we seek great wisdom for there are difficult cases in which we must consider this command. But the fact of the matter is, is that the command is given to every one of us to honor father and mother. Again, our main idea, we must honor our parents as we trust in our Savior Jesus, who honored his parents. The implications for obeying this command are tremendous. And the consequences for neglecting are devastating. So let's consider this subject, study this subject. Let's do so with humility, asking God for the wisdom to know how to obey what he has clearly commanded. So what we're going to look at this morning, I have two main sections. We're going to first look at an explanation of honoring one's parents, and then I'll give us an example of honoring one's parents. First, the explanation of honoring one's parents. And to explain this, I have five words for us. So five subpoints here, five words that will explain the marks of what it means for, to honor one's parents. So the first is this, to explain what we mean by this is the word prize. Okay, the word prize. We must value or prize, we must value the role of parents. If we are to give honor to mother and father, we must value the role of parents. We prize them. The word we have translated honor in our English Bibles that what Yahweh wrote with his finger on the original stone tablets and then was copied by Moses and then by scribes year after year on parchments and text. And the Hebrew word written down is the word kabed. Kabed. And that word literally means, that the word means honor. And what that literally means is to be heavy or to be weighty. Uh, when something or someone is honored, we consider it to be significant. It's not light and airy like chaff that blows away and that's here today and gone tomorrow. It's something that is significant. It's an act or a character or an event that we do not want to forget. We must not forget. Some years ago, our, our family had a great opportunity to travel out to the East Coast. And we made a point to visit certain national memorials that give honor to people and to events that should weigh heavy on our memories. Now, we had the privilege to, uh, to drive into uh, Pennsylvania and to visit the Gettysburg Battlefield. And there are monuments scattered all over that mountainside there indicating that something significant happened at this place. Uh, we were in New York City, and we saw the 9-11 the memorial pools and, and surrounding that memorial, all the names of those who perished in those towers etched there. And you, we remember that the, the phrase from that time that was repeated again and again, we must never forget, we must not forget. And so it's to be weighty. Uh, we, we were able to go to Washington, D.C., and we spent an afternoon walking around Arlington Cemetery. And we watched the changing of the guard at the, the tomb of the unknown soldier. And I remember that day, it being a very hot and sunny day. And there was probably a couple hundred people watching that soldier just march back and forth and back and forth um, in, in exact precise cadence. And they were waiting for the changing of the guard, for it's, it's quite an, an elaborate and precise uh, proceeding that, that happens. And so as people are waiting... As the, the soldier walks back and forth, they're there casually, and some were chatting, and some sat on the stone steps that were there waiting. At one point, the commander of the guard carefully marched out while the current guard continued his duty. And the commander was there to announce that the change would take place very soon. And with a loud and obviously commanding order, he addressed the waiting crowd and I don't remember exactly what he said, but I will never forget how he said it. He said something like, out of respect for this memorial, you will be silent and standing. And man, people just shut up immediately. And they all stood up. 
And they just, they, they remember, oh, we are here for something more than just watching someone pace. He's not pacing. He's guarding. The gravitas of what, was, what we are witnessing was being communicated. And that place, that event demanded honor. And the Lord says that the father and mother must receive such honor. The roles of parents are to be respected. And the importance of both, both are mentioned, both the mother and father are to be recognized. Both are not, neither are considered as optional or unnecessary or redefinable. The Lord gives honor to both father and mother, and God designed both and gives equal honor to both. Now, of course, we say and we see, we see, we often see families that do not have a mother or a father or either. So an aunt or a grandmother or praise God for foster parents that have stepped in. And we thank God for that gracious provision. And it's true that not every family has both father and mother or either father and mother. And we see that God cares for all of his little ones and circumstances. But when a father or mother is not present, or when they are present but not acting honorably, we recognize something important is missing. The lack of an honorable mother or fatherable father is a loss because the mother and father are valuable. Therefore, we should value our mothers and fathers, so that we can honor them. Now, some of these last comments that I've made lead us to another mark that characterizes the person who honors parents. So let's look at the, the second, second word here of the five, and that is the word pardon. It's the word pardon. If we are to honor, we must be willing to forgive the sins of our parents. We must be willing to forgive the sins of our parents. The command for us to honor our parents has an underlining expectation on parents to act in an honorable way. In fact, when Paul speaks of this in Ephesians chapter 6 and he instructs children to honor their parents in the home by obeying them, he then immediately instructs fathers not to provoke his children to wrath. He's saying, don't act in such a way that you tempt your children to not honor you and suffer the consequences of their disobedience. Parents, we have a great responsibility to act honorably. Yet every parent here, every parent knows the shame of sinning against their children. We have all failed. We've all failed unintentionally. And just our weaknesses, even when we try our, on our best days, we fall short in our shortcomings. But we have also failed our children intentionally in anger, impatience, selfishness, our pride. The list goes on and on and on in how we have sinned against our children. And every one of us, every one of us, have been sinned against by our parents. And it is painful, discouraging, and such is, it tempts us to excuse ourselves from respecting them as God has commanded. Often, the differences and the shortcomings, the failures of our parents becomes fodder for our jokes as we sit around with those of similar age and our friends, and we sit around with our friends. And it's not uncommon for each generation to think of the previous generation as some old fuddy-duddies. Those who, who used to say, don't trust anyone over 30, are now hearing snickering behind them, okay, boomer, right? But it's not just what we perceive as their shortcomings. Our parents have certainly sinned against us at times. The ones who were tasked to teach us right from wrong have done us wrong. And we can be tempted to hold on to those grudges, 
to be strangled by those grudges. We must extend to our parents grace, the grace that we have received in Christ. Here's your memory verse for the week, Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now, as I call us to be willing to forgive, I want to echo a compassionate comment by Dennis Rainey. And he makes in his book, The Forgotten Commandment, which he writes about honoring parents. And he says this. So please hear this. Quote, For some of you, hearing this will revive painful memories of a parent that abandoned you. Some of you have suffered physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. For you, the idea of honoring your parent is almost repugnant. You may feel intense anger just thinking about it. There's compassion for you. And he goes on, he says, I certainly have no desire to place on you a burden that you are unable to carry at this time, end quote. Just know that this, the, the verses and the instruction to forgive, it is not a simple chiding to say, you know, just forgive and forget. It's time to move on. That, that is not God's heart in this matter at all. God takes sin very seriously. He takes your sin seriously, and he takes how you have been sinned against so, so seriously. So seriously that he sent his own son for redemption. Nothing short of sacrificing the very son of God could ever make forgiveness possible. Because of sin, pardon or forgiveness will always be necessary for each of us as we seek to honor our parents because every one of us has sinful parents. Every parent is a sinner. We have all experienced this and there is a need for forgiveness. I'm going to come back to this topic slightly a bit later in the sermon. But let's look at the third mark that characterizes the one who honors father and mother. We've seen the word prize. We value parents. We pardon. Number three, pursue. Pursue. We must move towards our parents. We must move towards a healthier relationship with our parents, however so slightly we are able to move. That's the direction we want to be facing. The command is given here to the child. Okay, the command is given to the child. The child, and this is an adult child or a young child, the child has the responsibility to give honor. The parent has responsibilities. They have responsibilities to, to teach the truth and to reward obedience and to discipline disobedience. But the child must do the honoring. A parent cannot make a child honor them. We can certainly and we must rebuke dishonor and correct dishonor. But honor must be given. It cannot be taken. It cannot be forced. It cannot be coerced. Even though the outward may be aligning True honor must be given. And therefore, we as children want to do all that we are able to do to move towards our parents rather than isolate from our parents. Another verse to consider is Romans 12, verse 18. It says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And that includes parents. That's, there is the caveat, though, so far as it depends on you, because there certainly are times when the other person and even the parents resist such efforts. But because you desire to honor your parents and all that you are able to do, you move toward them, however slightly, patiently, and carefully you may be able to do so. How do we do this, though? I mean, there are, there are different ways that we can move towards our parents and, and encourage a, a better relationship with them. I mean, we want to know our parents. We want to be students of our parents and, and pay attention to what's important to them. Do they like cards? Do they like phone calls? Do they like gifts? Are there certain foods that they, that they like? What, what skills do they have that you can ask them for help just for the opportunity to, 
to be together. Give them your time. Schedule some of your time on either a regular basis, of a weekly or a monthly or whatever that is, that, that you would give them your time. Not everyone will take vacations, but that might be for some, right, that you, you do, but you spend time, you do events together. You can seek their advice. That doesn't mean you necessarily follow it, but you can hear them out. Now, I realize this is not applicable to all situations, for truly there are some parents that are quite controlling and manipulative, so this is not just a blanket statement for everyone. But, but we want to hear and hear opinions, and not everything needs to be a, a fight with them. We want to write them or call them, okay? Reach out, move towards them. Okay, a fourth word. A fourth word that we're going to look at here is the word praise. Praise. How do we honor our parents? We must celebrate the evidence of grace in our parents. Celebrate the evidence of grace in our parents. At Mother's Day, today Father's Day, these are calendar events that we devote to sending cards and messages to express thanks and appreciation. And you know what, that's a, that's a good thing to do. I, I, people despise it. Ah, oh, it's just a Hallmark thing. Yeah, of course, of course Hallmark's going to make their money off of it. But you know what, it's a good thing. In fact, usually, I don't know what Mother's Day, we, we don't mention Proverbs thirty one twenty eight, which says her children rise up and bless her. Right? And so actually speaking well and, and blessing is a good thing to do. And we should honor our father and mother with our words. Because of the grace that is seen in their life. And, and some are saying, yeah, but my parents are not believers. And, and they have not received God's saving grace. And, and, and you continue to pray for them. But you know, every person has, has received God's common grace and there are evidences of even common grace in their life. And so we should speak of such to them. Thank you for working so hard to provide for our family. Thank you for caring for me when I was sick. You were patient with me in those troubled years and with my sin. Your commitment in marriage was a source of security for me. Your tireless efforts as a single parent is evidence of your selfless love. What you gave up to serve us, thank you. Your sense of humor has encouraged me at times. Thank you for praying for me. And we can go on and on and think of grace that we see that God has brought in them and even through them. Both spoken and written words can express honor to parents. A fifth mark. A fifth mark which characterizes one who honors his or her parents is with the word provide. Provide. We must supply as we are able for their care in their old age or their needy age. One of the ways in which we honor our mother or father is to do all that is within our ability to address their care in their older age. Parents have provided for their children as the children are young and, and helpless, and children are to return the blessing. Jesus rebuked the religious hypocrites who prided themselves in keeping their traditions while ignoring the clear commands of God. He called them out because they were not honoring their parents by providing for them financially because they said, oh, the money that I have is what they called Corbin. It was devoted to God. And so, sorry, parents, I, I can't use it on you because I'm, I'm doing it for God. And they claimed to honor God, and yet Jesus says, you are dishonoring your parents, which in turn dishonors God. Paul also instructed Timothy in the, the function of the church in 1 Timothy he instructs the church to, in chapter 5 to provide for widows who have no other means of income. But those widows who have children should be honored or provided for by their families. He says in 1 Timothy 5, 3 and 4, Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. It's shameful when the elderly are neglected, first by their families and 
by society. To do so is to neglect the command to honor father and mother. So we are clearly called as adult children to honor our mother and father. That means we need to prize or value God's design of parents. That We need to pardon or forgive the sins of our parents because we too have been forgiven. Honor happens when we pursue a relationship or an improved relationship, however slowly and patiently we must proceed. Honor is given through praise as we recognize God's grace in and through our parents. And we honor our parents as we provide as we are able for their care when they are unable to care for themselves. Now, I've, I've actually preached this subject in the past at churches that I've, uh, church that I pastored. And I remember preaching it, and you would think it would elicit, you know, quaint responses like, what a sweet topic for us to remember, and thanks for all the fuzzy feelings. But the fact of the matter, I remember after preaching this, and people coming up, they were encouraging me, and they weren't angry with me or anything, but they were very serious comments because it dug up such painful memories. And I realized that this is a difficult subject for many people because some people's greatest pain is associated with their parents. And I mention such responses because if you felt angst for the last 25 minutes by the thought of God's command to honor your father and mother, you are not alone. You are not alone in that. And I want you to know that you are not abandoned to just figure this out on your own. This isn't just dumped on you and say, figure it out. It's hard. Suck it up and make it work. No, you can receive help today. You know who's going to help you? Jesus. Jesus is available today to help you with this specific command. He is our example of honoring one's parents We must honor our parents as we trust in our Savior, Jesus, who also honored his parents. So we see the explanation of honoring parents with these five marks. But let's look in our second part here, the example of honoring one's parents. The example of honoring one's parents. Because God did not give you the command to honor father or mother and then leave you to figure out an impossible goal. The same one who gives this command, sent his very son to fulfill the command. Jesus came into this world in part so that he could honor a mother and father. He did that because you and I are called to honor our mother and father. So we're going to look at why Jesus honored his parents, how he honored his parents, and to what benefit did Jesus fulfill the fifth commandment to honor father and mother. And we can be helped by him as we seek to obey this command. So first, why did Jesus honor his parents? Why did Jesus honor his parents? Now there are many ways that we could answer that question, but one answer is this. Jesus fulfilled God's law to honor one's father and mother because you and I are unable to. Jesus fulfilled God's law to honor father and mother because you and I are unable to. The Bible says that we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. To fall, sin, to fall short is to, to miss the mark. Even those of you who have tried with all your heart to honor your parents, you've still failed to honor as God has commanded. Remember the rich young ruler? Rich young ruler who came to Jesus and, and, you know, he's asking Jesus about eternal life. And, and Jesus talked about the commandments. And he says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And that guy says, all of these I've kept from my youth. But the fact of the matter is, he didn't perfectly. None of us have kept any of the commands in a way that reflects perfectly God's glory. Now, we may have done better than others, and as we compare ourselves to others, well, it's always easy to find someone worse off than you. But 
when we look at God's standard, which is God's glory, we fall short. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And our attempts have fallen short of God's glory. It's for this reason, our sin, our sin of not honoring our parents perfectly makes us lawbreakers. First John 3, 4, everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And we are all guilty of breaking God's law. James 2.10, whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at one point has become guilty of all. It is for this reason that the Father sent Jesus into the world, that he would take on human flesh, that it would be born of a woman. And it says in Galatians 4.4, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so Jesus came into this world in humanity in part so that he might honor mother and father, the fifth commandment. He came into the world so that he could shed his blood to redeem us from the curse or the consequences of our sin, that we might be cleansed, but also that he would fulfill righteousness that could then be counted or imputed to the soul of every person who trusts in him. You have rebelled against God every time you have dishonored your parents in word or deed or motive. But Jesus fulfilled God's law by honoring his parents. We must honor our parents as we trust in our Savior Jesus, who also honored his. Let's look secondly at how did Jesus honor his parents. And this is interesting because... There are different ways throughout his earthly life that we see him giving honor to his parents. And it's instructive for us, helpful to us. Number one, he honored his parents when they had authority over him. This goes back a bit to, to what we talk with the children in the home. And our, our first example, if you would, turn over in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. This, this is that passage describing when Jesus was a 12-year-old. All right, he's in the vine, right? If he was, if he was here. <laughs> Jesus is 12 years old. He's still living under the authority of his parents. And the situation of conflict arose between Jesus and his parents. Look at verse 41. It says, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when, his, when he was, became 12, when he became, sorry, when he became 12, they went up according to the feast, the custom of the feast. And there they were returning after spending the full number of days. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. But supposed him to be with them in the caravan, they went a day's journey and began looking for him in among, among their relatives and acquaintances. They did not find him, and they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, Why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had been in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and continued in subjection or in submission to them. And his mother treasured these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So Jesus, Jesus stays behind. His parents don't know it. They're in the caravan, and they think he's just in the crowd. And it's not till a day later till they realize he's not there. And they go back and find him. And we hear Mary expressing her fear and frustration of not knowing where Jesus had been. 
I, most of you parents probably know this feeling. If you've ever lost your kid in, the, in a store or you've been at a park, I've been at a park and one of my children all of a sudden, you know, younger age and they're, they're not there and all of a sudden I go in like Navy SEAL mode. I'm like ready for war and I'm just looking around and I'm just, where is this child? And, and you know what I mean? And it's just, you find them and you're just panicked and they're just playing in the sand. You know what I mean? Like this, like, like no big deal. But you could, so you, want, you sympathize with Mary in this. And yet, when they said, we want you to accompany us on a journey, verse 51 says, Jesus was submissive to them. He recognized their authority, and he followed their instruction. This is an example of Jesus doing what is instructed of all children under their parents' authority. Colossians 3.20, Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. It's, it's important to notice that this is not a matter of choosing between right action or wrong action. I mean, Jesus being in the temple could honor God. Being in the caravan could honor God. This is a matter of the parent's preference. And the child needs to submit to the parent's preference in submission if they are to honor the parents and obey God. Kids, teenagers, parents have policies in the home. And they're not necessarily about right and wrong. They're about preferences. And it's their preferences, not your preferences. This includes things like curfews and house rules of this goes here and not there at this time and not that time. And it's about clothing choices for you. Music vol- volume, and the list, I know, goes on and on and on and on and on. We know it does. When you are dependent upon them and under their authority, you must obey them in all of these things. And Jesus did that. As you struggle with that, you ask Jesus for help. He understands. He sympathizes. Secondly, though, as we look at how Jesus honored his parents, we look at a different time of his life. He honored his parents, number two, when they had expectations of him. He honored his parents when they had expectations of them. In the Gospels, we see examples of Jesus interacting honorably with Mary when he was no longer under his parents' authority. Joseph is is not mentioned in the Gospels any time after Luke chapter 2 passage, so we assume that he has died. Jesus, being an an adult, responds to Mary's expectations. I don't know. Do parents have expectations of adult children? Does that happen sometimes? Some of you are nodding vigorously, right? It depends on who you are asking if they have expectation. The parent of adult children will say, "I, I don't have expectations. I just have dreams for their good. What I want for them is what they should want for themselves anyways, right? And if an adult child is asked, they may respond saying, good grief, they won't leave me alone. In fact, I'm going to do the opposite just to teach them a lesson. You know, we've all struggled with finding out how to honor parents as adult children. Often we see either extreme in which a child spurns the interaction with their parents and accuse them of constant meddling. Or the adult child just lives all their days trying to please every whim of their parents. But we see Jesus respond to Mary's expectations of him. John chapter 2, I'm not going to have you turn there and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because Pastor Jay is going to preach that real soon here, I think next week. And so I'm not going to steal from that. But, but John chapter 2, we see Jesus beginning his very public ministry. And he's attending a wedding of a family, and they're having a social crisis at the wedding. They've run out of wine. And for some reason, Mary's involved, and she informs Jesus of the situation. And Jesus responds to her, and it, it sounds like a strange response. He says, he says to his mother, woman, what does that have to do with me? Now, I don't know about you. I never say woman to my mother. But, uh, so maybe this is a cultural thing there. But he says, woman, what, what, literally it says, what to you and to me? essentially saying, why are you concerning me with this? And he then says, my hour has not yet come. 
And Jesus is making a point to Mary that he's, he's here for a purpose different than what she is focused on. He's come to make sure a greater wedding goes off without a hitch, the wedding supper of the Lamb. And this is not the first nor the last time Mary fails to remember the greater calling Jesus has. But Mary trusts Jesus in this situation, and she tells the servants, do whatever he instructs you. And we remember Jesus responded to his mother's request by turning the, the water into wine. He did it because it served to honor God's calling upon his earthly life. Verse 11 there says it manifested his glory. Jesus responded favorably to his mother's desire when it served to fulfill God's purpose for his earthly life. But notice another situation. Turn over to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, 20 and 21. Because here we see Jesus not responding favorably to his mother's des desire. Mark 3, verse 20 and 21 say, And he came home, and the crowd gathered again to such an extent that they could not eat a meal. When his own people heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. They're saying, Jesus has gone crazy. Look down in verse 31. He's in there teaching, and it talks about his teaching there, but it says in verse 31, it says, Then his mother and his brothers arrived, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. The crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Answering them, he said, Who are my mother and my brothers? Looking about at those who were sitting around him, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. In the middle of Jesus' ministry, he's, he's becoming more popular with the, uh, more unpopular with the Jewish leaders. And Jesus is rebuking them strongly. And in fact, in verse 30, he's, um, we see that they are accusing him of being demon-possessed. And his family is greatly concerned for his physical and mental well-being. And they are unwilling to be in the house under his teaching and they're calling for him to leave that ministry and to come out to them. In fact, they're even willing to seize him or to take him by force. And Mary requests Jesus come to them. But he refuses because he must do the will of God. Jesus taught that there, were, there may be times when families are divided because doing the will of God becomes a point of contention. The same Jesus who said to honor father and mother, also says in Matthew 10, For I came to set man against father and daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his household. And he says, He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So there are times when an adult child will make a decision that is contrary to, to his or her parents' desire. But he is committed to honoring God. It's important to remember that causing a parent's displeasure is not necessarily the same thing as giving them dishonor. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego displeased Nebuchadnezzar, but they did so in an honorable way to the glory of God when they refused to bow to his idol. And Jesus responded to his mother's expectations in such a way that Jesus honored his mother every single time. He did not always do what she wanted, but he sought to do the will of God always. As adult children, we leave our parents and cleave to our spouse, and this will eventually mean we make decisions to follow God's will. And that may not always be our parents' primary desire at the time. And Jesus honored his parents when they had expectations of him. Also, thirdly, he honored his parents when they had need of him. He honored his mother right up to the point of his death on the cross. In John 19, 25 to 27, and because of time I'm not going to have us turn there, he's hanging on the cross. He sees his mother standing nearby. And John, the apostle, the apostle whom he loved, 
the disciple whom he loved, and he makes arrangements for her right there, for her physical care, when he will no longer be available. And what a contrast to, to those who devoted in Corbin, devoted unto God their money to gain prestige among the community rather than care for their parents. We, we might expect Jesus would be off the hook as he's hanging on the cross, right? I mean, and yet he takes the time while dying for her sin, fulfilling the law of honoring mother, he does that for her while, while he's hanging on the cross. And so we see that we are to be caring for parents in their need, aging parents. And it's not easy. Sometimes we don't even know what we should do. It's especially difficult for parents uh, when, when parents are unable to care for their practical daily needs. And I've, I've sat with people different times trying to make decisions of what to do with their parents and whether to put into a home or bring them into their own home. And, and each child can only answer that question in God's wisdom in their particular situation. It may be necessary and even better, better for a parent to be served by professional caregivers. I mean, Jesus placed Mary into John's home. He did all that was necessary to see that his mother was, was cared for. For what benefit does Jesus honor his parents? Let's look at that thoroughly. For what benefit does Jesus honor his parents? He provides righteousness before God. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was demonstrating his righteousness by keeping the law perfectly. And that righteousness is provided to our account. You and I fall short of the glory of God in every attempt to keep his law. But Jesus does not. Jesus fulfills this, and here is an example of him fulfilling God's law. His righteousness is our hope. You may be discouraged today by your failures to honor parents as you have failed to in the past. Know this, you stand before God in Jesus' righteousness of honoring his parents. He did this for you. We do not continue in the sin of dishonoring parents to let grace abound. No, we are now slaves of Jesus' righteousness. And so we want to honor our parents as Jesus honored his. And we may find it difficult, and we battle temptation every day. So to what other benefit? Jesus, he provides help for us before temptation. Hebrews 2, 17 and following Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation or satisfaction for the sins of people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus can sympathize with the difficulty submit, to submit to sinful parents. You think you know better than your parents? Jesus certainly knew better than his parents. And yet he subjected himself when it was necessary, and he honored them throughout his life. He can sympathize with the difficulty of honoring parents who have expectations. He had to wisely make decisions with each expectation to know which would honor God. So look to him. And ask him, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach. He's not going to make fun of you or despise, despise you. He will generously give you wisdom. Jesus can help you as you seek to honor your parents because he honored his. We must honor our parents as we trust in our Savior Jesus who honored his parents. It takes faith to honor your mother and father. Hebrews 11 records example after example of, peop of the people of God who walked by faith. You know how they did it? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which, so, which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us honor our parents as we trust in our Savior Jesus, who faithfully honored his. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our Savior Jesus. He has saved us, Lord, in, in every part, Lord, in, in every way that we have sinned against you, he has made provision. Thank you so much for our Savior. And thank you for our parents. Thank you for the parents of Calvary. And we would pray, Father, you will give them grace to patiently walk in honor. That, Father, they may be a testimony of your grace and give grace to all children to respect and honor their parents to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.